I'd like to welcome our participants to a training sponsored by the Administration for Children and Families Office of Refugee Resettlement. We'll discuss today the implications and application of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to persons who are limited English proficient. My name is Paul Cushing. I'm the Regional Manager in the Office for Civil Rights in the Mid-Atlantic Region in Philadelphia. What we'll cover today specifically are the law and the regulations, Executive Order 13166, and we'll talk about guidelines that have been published by the Department to entities that receive federal assistance for providing meaningful access to persons who are limited English proficient. First, a glossary of terms. You'll hear the terms statute or law, regulation, and guidelines. Statute is the law that's passed by Congress, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, for example. Regulations are developed to implement the law that's passed by Congress, and they have the force and effect of law. When the Department of Justice represents the government in a court action around Title VI, the regulations will be the primary basis for the case. Guidelines are recommendations or advice. They're not necessarily enforceable the way the regulation is, but they provide a benchmark for entities to ensure that they're in compliance with the law. This collage shows some historic events around the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and some of the prominent figures that were involved in that legislation. President Kennedy, Dr. King, and President Johnson, who signed the law into effect in July of 1964. The law is fairly simple. It states no person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Now, Title VI is really the granddaddy or the grandmom, depending on your perspective, of all postmodern day civil rights legislation. All of our legislation that prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability, age, and in some cases gender, are built on the foundation that was established by Title VI. The law prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, and national origin in any program that receives federal financial assistance. It protects persons of every race, color, or national origin, but it generally does not cover employment. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act does that. Now, what do we mean by the terms race, color, and national origin? There are five basic categories that have been established by the Department of Justice and the Office of Management and Budget for race. The first category is white or Caucasian, not of Hispanic origin. The second is black or African American, not of Hispanic origin. The third is Hispanic. The fourth is Asian and Pacific Islander. And the fifth is Native Alaskan and Native American. The second basis, color, is not a proxy for race. It is the color of your skin. And the third basis, national origin, is your country of origin or your country of ancestry. It's not your country of citizenship. Now, when we talk about discrimination under Title VI, there are really three types. There's disparate treatment, disparate impact, and retaliation. Disparate treatment is the willful, intentional form of discrimination. It's George Wallace in front of the schoolhouse door. Disparate impact is where you have a policy or practice that has the effect of discriminating against an individual or a class of individuals, even though it's on its face, it's neutral. And the third type of discrimination is retaliation. If an individual engages in a protected action, namely they file a civil rights complaint or they participate in a civil rights investigation, and something adverse happens to them, and there's a causal relationship between their engaging in that protected activity and the adverse action, that's a retaliation claim, and that's also investigated under Title VI. Who is covered by the law? Who's obligated to comply? Any entity that receives money from the Department of Health and Human Services, either directly from the department or indirectly, and it can come in the form of a grant, a loan, a contract, or a subcontract. A couple of examples. The State Department of Social Service may use funds that it receives from the Community Services Block Grant to support job training centers. A local private refugee resettlement agent may operate their program in a building that once was a Social Security District office, and the office was deeded over to that agency. As long as the agency holds that deed, that's federal financial assistance. 
A Public Health Service Commission Corps officer is detailed to a State Office of Emergency Preparedness. The federal government is paying that officer's benefits and their salary. So as long as that officer is working for that state agency, that constitutes federal financial assistance. These are just a few examples. Now, what does Title VI of the Civil Rights Act prohibit? It says that recipients of federal assistance shall not deny an individual a service, an aid, or other benefit. They can't provide a benefit or an aid or a service which is different or that's provided in a different manner than provided to other individuals. It can't subject an individual to segregation or separate treatment. Recipients also can't restrict individuals in the enjoyment of any benefits or privileges that are afforded through a program that's receiving federal funds. They can't treat an individual differently in determining their eligibility. Let's say, for example, when a person applies for cash benefits and they have to demonstrate that they are either a citizen of this country or they're a legal resident. And the caseworker will require a person whose surname is Jimenez to provide more documentation than they might require someone whose last name is Smith. That could be a possible violation of Title VI. Finally, they can't deny a person the opportunity to participate on a planning board. All of these prohibitions fall under the theory of discrimination that we call disparate treatment. Disparate impact discrimination falls under these two areas. First of all, an entity may not be able to use any criteria or methods of administration to defeat or impair the accomplishment of a program's objectives. Now that's probably a fairly unclear statement, but what it really means is you can't have policies or practices that will have the effect of discriminating against someone, even though those policies or practices may be neutral on their face. Also, programs that receive federal assistance cannot select sites or locations for those programs that will exclude protected individuals. If the agency is operating a program in an urban area where there is a substantial number of persons who are limited English proficient, and they decide to move the location to, of the program to a suburban area where there's limited transportation, lim limited public access to that location for those individuals who are previously being served by the program, that can constitute a violation of Title VI. Now, what's the connection between the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and specifically Title VI and persons who are limited English proficient? Notice the law says it prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, and national origin. It doesn't say anything about language. Well, first, the regulatory connection is that fairly unclear language where we talk about recipients not utilizing criteria or methods of administration that have the effect of subjecting individuals to discrimination. In other words, policies or practices. The connection was made for us by the Supreme Court in 1974 in a decision called Lao v. Nichols. In that decision that dealt with a group of first-generation Chinese children in a public school district, the court ruled that Title VI prohibits conduct that has disproportionate effect on limited English proficient persons because such conduct constitutes national origin discrimination. So what the court did was it extended the protections of the bases of national origin found under Title VI to persons who are limited English proficient. Now the second aspect that we want to talk about today is an executive order that was first promulgated by the Clinton administration in August of 2000. And it was reaffirmed by the Bush administration in August of 2003. What does the executive order do? Well, it requires federal agencies to do two things. First, we have to ensure that we provide meaningful access to persons who are limited English proficient, so that our publications are available in languages other than English. If you look on Social Security's website, for example, you'll find that the Social Security Administration has published a number of their program documents into languages other than English. The second requirement is that federal grant-making agencies, like the Department of Health and Human Services, must publish Title VI guidelines that will explain and provide examples and direction for entities that receive federal assistance as to what steps they need to take to ensure that they're in compliance with Title VI. So what do recipients of federal assistance have to do? Those organizations that receive money fr from the federal government and particularly the Department of Health and Human Services. Under Title VI and its implementing regulations, recipients must take reasonable steps 
to ensure meaningful access to their programs, their activities, and their services for persons who are limited English proficient. Now, reasonable people can disagree on what we mean by reasonable. So the guidelines that we talk about really set out some standards or benchmarks. Now, we've used the term limited English proficient person. Who is that individual? Well, it's a person who does not speak English as their primary language, and they have a limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English. The guidelines lay out a four-factor analysis, which really helps to determine the level of response for entities that receive federal financial assistance. Because of the diversity of the programs that HHS funds and the variety of locations that they are throughout the country, we tried to build in some flexibility to the guidelines so that local organizations and local grantees can decide based on information they process through these factors as to what's the best approach for them to ensure that there's meaningful access for persons who are limited English proficient. Now we'll go through the four factors in detail in a moment, but I'd just like to present to them to you first. First factor is the number or proportion of persons that are eligible to be served or likely to be affected by a program or service. The second factor is the frequency of contact, how often you encounter somebody who is limited English proficient. The third is the nature and importance of the program, the activity or the service. And then the fourth consideration is the cost and the resources that are available. Now factor one, how many persons are eligible to be served or likely to be affected by a recipient program or activity? There's a number of potential sources of data which can help in deciding and gathering information. First, encounter data. We encourage entities that receive federal assistance to capture information about their clients and the language that they speak. Second source of data is data from the census. School systems capture data of language that's spoken in the home, and then some state and local governments will also have information about languages that individuals speak. And then finally, community organizations that represent ethnic groups can also have at least anecdotal data about what populations are coming into a particular community. You also need to consider, does the program serve minors whose parents or guardians are limited English proficient? Or are there populations who may be underserved because of those language barriers? The second factor is the frequency of contact. How often is a particular language encountered? And what is that language? Is it Spanish? Is it Korean? Is it Russian? Is it Vietnamese? Oftentimes, the best source of information on the frequency of contact are those program operators who are on the front lines, who have the daily client or patient contact. They will have the best feel for what the frequency of encounter and the frequency of contact is. The third factor is the nature and importance of the program, the activity, or the service. How important is this activity, the information that's provided, the service, or the program? And what are the possible consequences if effective communication is not achieved? Could denial or delay of access to services or information have serious life-threatening implications? So for example, a hospital that's located in a community where there is a high population of persons who are limited English proficient, they operate in an emergency department. Persons come in for emergent health issues. Some of those issues could be life-threatening. That hospital may need to have an interpreter on site 24 hours a day, or at least through the schedule and the, and the shifts where there is a high activity in the emergency room. Now compare that hospital to an information and referral agency that's located in a rural area. They have an infrequent encounter of persons who are limited English proficient, and the primary role of that program is to provide information or guidance about programs or available services, job opportunities, training not quite on the same plane of importance as services that are provided in an emergency room. So that organization, that information and referral agency may be able to rely on a language line or scheduling persons to come in when they have an interpreter available. So there's some flexibility built into the guidelines. The fourth factor are the cost and the resources. What are the costs associated with providing language assistance services? And what are the resources that are available? And we talk about resources. We don't just mean financial resources. But what are the resources in the local community? Are there interpreter referral services? 
Are there staff? Are there community organizations who have language skills? Are there staff on the, on the entity that can provide language assistance services? So the factors of financial cost and the resources that are available is the fourth factor that you consider in determining what the level of approach is and the best approach to providing services to persons who are limited English proficient. Now, selecting language assistance services, there's two major considerations to be addressed. The first is competency, and the second is timeliness. Let's talk about interpreter competency first. The recipient needs to take reasonable steps to assess that the interpreter that they use is able to do a number of things. One, they need to demonstrate proficiency in both English and the other language. You can't know a lot of English and a little Spanish, or a lot of Spanish and a little English, and be an effective interpreter. The interpreter needs to demonstrate their knowledge of specialized terms or concepts, particularly in medical settings where there's terminology that's not used in common everyday conversation. Or those terminology or concepts may not have a readily translatable equal in the other language. So the interpreter has to be able to paint, paint the picture to effectively describe what's being conveyed. The interpreter needs to demonstrate an understanding of the need for confidentiality and impartiality. What happens in, in the hospital or what happens in that program activity or that service center stays there. It doesn't go out to the community. And finally, the interpreter needs to understand their role. They're not advocates for the person. They're not providing information that they think the client should be providing to ensure that they're receiving the benefits. They need to clearly interpret what the client is saying and accurately convey it to the program or to the service. The second factor is timeliness. When language assistance is needed and is reasonable, it should be provided in a timely manner at a time and a place that avoids the effective denial or delay of the service or the benefit. Now, we've used the term language assistance services. What do we mean by that? Well, there's a number of options. And if you look at this slide, kind of look at it as a menu. Each of these five elements here have pluses and minuses. You can use bilingual staff. Some agencies find that it's best to employ staff interpreters because of the volume of persons who are limited English proficient that they encounter. The use of contractors is another approach to providing language assistance services. Some agencies are able to rely on language telephone lines or language assistance lines as they're commonly referred to because the frequency of encounter is limited or they may encounter languages that there's just no resources in the community for them to tap into. A person comes into a community and they speak Farsi and the interpreter referral service that's in the community doesn't have any interpreter who's skilled to provide interpretation services in that language. So their next choice is to go to a language line. Community volunteers are a fifth option and community volunteers often grow out of ethnic organizations. They're individuals who have been in this country for years. They've had success in business. They retire and they want to give something back to the community. They still maintain their language skills, and so they will offer those skills to agencies to go with people to the Social Security office, for example, or the local health clinic, and provide interpreting services. I mentioned earlier that each of these have their pluses and minuses. Some agencies will reach first to the bilingual staff because it's staff they already have on board. They're not paying anything additional. However, they need to ensure that those staff understand the role of the interpreter and that their language skills and their interpreting skills are sufficient so that they can effectively communicate for the client or the patient that comes in. And they also need to consider that they want to adjust that person's workload. We had an investigation one time where we were interviewing caseworkers and they indicated that they were happy to assist their colleagues in providing their language assistance services, but then when they came back to their desk, their work was still there sitting for them and waiting for them. And so managers need to consider that when they provide those language assistance services using existing staff, they want to make sure they adjust the, the workload. Staff interpreters, as I mentioned earlier, are used oftentimes when the volume of interpreting is sufficient enough that they can support the hiring of an individual. Now, one of the more difficult considerations in providing language assistance services is the use of family members or friends as interpreters. 
The guidelines try and strike a balance between affording meaningful access to persons who are limited English proficient and respecting the choice of that individual if they wish to use a family member or a friend. However, there's a number of considerations that must come into play here. First of all, an agency needs to inform the person that an interpreter can be provided at no cost to them. Secondly, you cannot require an individual to provide their own interpreter. Third, agencies should not plan to rely on a family member or a friend to serve as an interpreter. And fourth, and probably most importantly, agencies should evaluate whether because of special concerns an interpreter should be provided anyway, even when an individual brings their own interpreter with them, be that a family member or a friend. Let's take, for example, a case where a social worker may suspect that there's domestic abuse or domestic violence in the home and their client comes in and the significant other or the spouse comes along and that spouse is going to serve as the interpreter. You're pretty much guaranteed you're not going to get the full story. So using your professional judgment, that social worker should say, well, we're going to use a third party anyway to interpret and we want to assure you that that interpreter will follow all the guidelines for confidentiality and privacy and nothing that's said in here will go outside this room. But for the protection of the agency and the individual and the quality of service, in that kind of a situation, professional judgment should apply. Now, we've talked about oral interpretation. I think we had mentioned earlier that language assistance services really come in two forms, the oral interpretation and then the translation of written documents. Now, there's a couple considerations around translating documents. First of all, the question should be asked, what documents should be translated and, to, and into what languages? The guidelines call for the translation of vital documents, and those are documents that are critical to the operation of a program or service. For example, notifications about benefits or changes in benefits, notifications about changes of locations of where services are going to be provided, notifications about sanctions that are being applied because a client didn't follow the requirements of the program. Those are vital documents, those critical documents that make the program go. Now a distinction needs to be made about languages that are frequently encountered and those less commonly encountered languages. Translating documents can be an expensive process and so agencies need to consider that second factor that we talked about earlier. What's the most frequently encountered language? If it's Spanish, then start there. Identify those vital documents that need to be translated and translate them into Spanish. Then what's the second most frequently encountered language? If it's Korean, then translate documents into Korean and then just work your way down the line. Now, there are some resources available online. I would direct you first to the second bullet here, the LEP, www.lep.gov. That's really a portal to other federal websites that deal with limited English proficiency issues. And then, of course, I have to recommend the hhs.gov slash OCR slash LEP website. That's the website that's provided by the Office for Civil Rights. There's quite a bit of information in there that's very helpful in providing you assistance and guidance and direction as you work through these four factors, work through the guidelines, and position yourself so that you are in compliance with Title VI. Thank you for your participation in the training today. I hope this information was helpful. If you have further questions, please feel free to contact one of our regional offices that are listed on our website at www.hhs.gov OCR. The listing of regional offices will identify which states those offices cover, so you can identify the appropriate office for you to contact. The listing will have phone numbers and websites for you to reach. Thank you again for your participation. I hope this information was helpful.